Amen. So Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 20 is an uh, interesting chapter. It really gets into just some practical matters about how they were going to conduct uh, certain elements of their warfare when they're going to the land. He's saying, you know, these are the type of people that you're going to leave behind. You know, these are the type of people that you're going to have go with you. And when you get to a city, this is what you're going to do there. But there are a lot of spiritual applications that we can make, even though it is a very practical uh, chapter on the warfare that they were going to conduct. And it begins there in verse 1, it says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say, Hear, uh, un say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be terrified because of them. The Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. So, of course, you know, this would be, uh, this is a, a very strong admonishment for them to not be afraid. And, you know, it only makes sense that God would have to do that because of the fact that, you know, warfare is a very fearful thing. You know, you're, you're putting your life on the line and, uh, you know, obviously it's going to be something that somebody could draw back from or not want to do, especially when it's the type of people that are described here when they're going to be facing people that have horses and chariots and more people than them. So it's not that they were just going to go, you know, steamroll over, you know, these weak uh, people, a lesser nation than them, but they were actually going up against, you know, cities that were, that were you know, walled high and they, they had chariots of iron. And, uh, you know, the Anakims were, were a great people, very tall. And, uh, you know, this was a very fearsome foe that they were, they were, they were fighting. Uh, you know, there's a reason why these people remained in that land so long. Nobody else was able to come and take this from them. And they were in this very good land. They were able to, to uh, you know, hold dominion over this, 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 this land that flowed with milk and honey all these years. And why was it? It's because they were very strong, powerful people. You know, of course, they were wicked. We understand that. But they were also very mighty. And that's why God here is just, you know, you know, reiterating the fact that they were not to be afraid. And that's something that he brings up over and over again, especially towards the end of Deuteronomy and even the beginning of Joshua. You see Moses specifically commanding uh, Joshua to not be afraid, to be of good courage, and, and over and over again. And here, even in this, this passage, it's, it's, almost, it's just redundant about not being afraid. And he says, uh, he says, let not your hearts faint. You know, he's, and he goes on and says, fear not and do not tremble. Neither be, uh, be terrified of them. So there's this ab admonition upon admonition to not be afraid of their enemies. And that is a great spiritual truth that we need to apply to ourselves today as Christians in this world. Is that we, uh, just as they had nothing to fear back then, we have nothing to fear today. You know, and and the, the truth is that we do have an enemy. That we, we wore a spiritual warfare. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But it's, it's a sad fact today that many preachers and Christians are fearful. They're afraid of being found out. They're afraid of any kind of conflict. They're afraid of having to take a stand for every, anything because of the repercussions that might come. And quite often, the things that they're afraid of don't even happen. They don't even come to pass. They're afraid of ghosts. They're afraid of phantoms. But even if it were a real enemy, if, even if there were, if we were to take a stand or we were to you know, put ourselves out there in some way for the cause of Christ, you know, we should still not be afraid because of the fact that just as God was with them back then, He will be with us today. Nothing has changed there. <coughs> and, you know, this is a command. This command not to fear is something that's repeated in the New Testament. It's something that comes up over and over again. If you would, go over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. One of my favorite chapters, Romans 8, talks about this. It says in Romans 8, What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You know, if God's on our side, who's going to stand against us? Uh, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him, us up, uh, delivered him up for us all, how shall he not uh, with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He goes on and he says that in all these things we are conquerors through him that loved us. He said, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Look, even if standing for Christ ended up costing you your, your life, you're still saved. Amen. You're still going to go to heaven. Christ is still on your side. You know, you're going to depart and be with the Lord, which is far better, as Paul said. And you know, it, that's something we have to keep in mind, especially you know, the day and age that we're living in. And we already see things kind of ramping up and you know, th this world is becoming less and less uh, Christian, less and less friendly towards Christianity, more and more hostile towards the things of God, towards the Bible, and those that would believe or preach the Bible, they're becoming more uh, hostile towards, that, uh, towards those things. You know, and that's only going to get worse. The Bible says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. It's going to get way worse before it gets better. And so we should keep this in mind. There might even come a day, uh, you know, where we have to maybe put our necks on the line for Christ. Amen. You know, that might not happen. You know, that might not be that for many generations. We might be able to live a quiet and peaceable life in the meantime. But it's already gotten to the point now where, you know, there, there, or, there already is going to be instances where we have to take a stand for Christ. Where we're going to say something in the workplace or we're going to say something with family members or out knocking doors or whatever it is and we don't know what the outcome is going to be. Right. We're going to say somebody say something to, we're going to say something to someone, we're going to quote Bible to them, we're going to teach them a doctrine, we're going to correct them with scripture, you know, in a loving way or even if it's a harsh rebuke and we're not going to know how they're going to react. Right. And a lot of people that that alone is enough to make them afraid. Just the the fear of the unknown of saying, "Well, I don't know how they're going to take it." Well, does it matter how they take it? If either if it's right, it's right. And they need to hear it. But a lot of people, they draw back. Why? Because they're afraid. And the Bible tells us over and over again not to be afraid, no matter how big the enemy seems to be. <laughs> Look there in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, for, uh, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 says, Not that I respe speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how both, to, both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, suffer need. He said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You know, if there was anybody in, the, in, this, in this world that had a reason to be afraid, it was Paul. I mean, that guy was stoned, he was beaten, he was whipped. I mean, you always just constantly see him getting in trouble with the Jews, constantly being persecuted, shipwrecked, just pursued, in jail. But yet he took a stand. You know, he took a stand, and, he, and what was what was it he was able to say? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That was, you know, the, the, the strength of the Lord. Uh, you know, that the joy of the Lord was his strength. That's what allowed him to stand, was knowing that he was in Christ. You know, and 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 it's I that verse is so famous, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And it just bugs me when I see people use that in a vain way. You know, they use that, you know, they tattoo it on themselves somewhere. And then, the, and then it's like, you know, and they're just like, you know, just they'd use it to, to, you know, professional athletes. You know, they'll say, they'll put this on them. Right. You know, I can do all things. I can make it through this training camp. You know, I can, I can make it through the off-season training. I can make it to the championship, whatever. That's a, and people use that verse so vainly all the time that it becomes cliche. It comes played out. But what, is that, what does that really mean there? That's Paul talking about the fact that I can face anything. I don't care what the circumstances is I, don't, uh, is. I don't care who the enemy is. I don't care what the circumstances are. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. And that's the spiritual application that we can get out of Deuteronomy chapter 20 in those opening verses. Is that when we face a great foe, that's our opportunity to do all things through Christ. And when we're up against impossible circumstances, when we have you know, an enemy before us, that's our opportunity to go to God and watch Him come through for us and to do a great work. <clears throat> you know, these are the words, Philippians chapter 4, 13, and, you know, these are not just vain words, but these are uh, of words of a man who knew what it meant to suffer for Christ and to face truly fearful circumstances. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I'll move on from that, but uh, let's go ahead and just jump into Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 5. Get in there. It says in verse 5, And the officers shall speak unto the people. So <clears throat> he's saying, look, you're going to go into this war, and the officers, they're going to speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house, and hath not dedicated? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle. And another man dedicated. And what man is there that hath planted a vineyard, and hath not eaten of it? Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat of it. 
And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. So <clears throat> the first, you know, this is a real interesting passage of scripture. I think this really shows us, uh, you know, where, what God, uh, that God wants us not to just be all about warfare. That there are certain things that God has given us in this life to enjoy. And it's important to him that we enjoy these things. And, you know, before we get into that, you know, let me, let me preface this by saying, you know, make no mistake about it. We are in a warfare. You know, we're involved in spiritual warfare today. We're, our call is not a call to physical arms. We understand that. But we are even a greater battle than that. The, the battle for, for the souls of men, for our families, for their spiritual well-being, for our own walk with Christ. You know, we have a real enemy with real weapons, but it's all spiritual. It's unseen. And I think that's why, because of the fact that it's invisible and it's not something tangible, often we kind of take that for granted. That we kind of think, yeah, I know the preacher says that. I know he quotes the Bible about that. But that is the reality that we're in. And the longer you live the, this life, the longer you try to you know, live for Christ and stand for him, the more true that becomes. The more you see that to start to you know, become a reality. When you start to see people fall victim to the devil, when you start to see people be snared by the devil and taken captive by him at his will, you know, and we see him start to get victories. And also when we see in our own lives, when we get victories over him, when we get some victory over some sin or we win some spiritual battle in our life, that's when we start to understand that we definitely are involved in a spiritual warfare today. But that's not what it's all about. But again, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto the whole armor of God that may be able to withstand the, in the evil day, having done all to stand. So we are in warfare. There's no doubt about it. And these people are involved in a physical warfare. That's what we're talking about in Deuteronomy chapter 20. But what God is showing us here is that the battle is not the only thing that matters in this life. <clears throat> and that's something that we have to keep in mind. And, you know, God gave man life, uh, God gave man life to be enjoyed. I mean, we think about when God created man and put, him in the, and put him in the garden. That was a very peaceful, you know, serene, calm set of circumstances. His only job was to dress and to keep the garden. He walked with the Lord in the cool of the day. I mean, that seems pretty good to me. There wasn't, you know, there was no trouble. There was no sin in the world. That was what God intended. And it wasn't until man fell, until man disobeyed, you know, that, that sin had entered in the world and death passed upon all men. That's when the conflict ended was through man's disobedience. But God's original intent is that, that man would enjoy you know, just existence, that he would enjoy fellowship with, with Christ and with God. So God gave man life to be enjoyed. <clears throat> and again, we are in a battle, but there's still more to life than just fighting. And this is something that, you know, what we've coined the ultra-spiritual in this, in this life need to probably take heed to. You know, people that are just all about the battle, you know, that there's, you know, they want to just live this super austere life and put off these other things and even sometimes often look down their nose at others who have elected to enjoy these things right. that God has given man to enjoy. You know, they would do well to listen to what God is telling the children of Israel here. I mean, that is the, the, the primary interpretation here of this verse. I mean, that's what God is saying to these men in, in, in verse 5 and so on. He's saying, look, if you, ha if you have... You know, if you've built a house and haven't dedicated, go back and do that. And he's saying, look, if you've planted a vineyard and not eaten it, go back and eat of it. If you've taken a wife, and, you know, go back and, and, uh, uh, and take her. Lest an, and why is it? Lest another man do it. Lest another man come take her. Lest another man come eat of your vineyard. Lest another man come and, uh, you know, dwell in your house. He says, you should enjoy that. Right. You know, you have... I mean, even in the law, in the law in, you know, I, I didn't put it in my notes, but the law was that if a man were to get married, he was to do no, no business for a year. Right. It doesn't mean he was supposed to sit around and be lazy for a year. He was supposed to do his daily work. But he was not to be employed in warfare. They would, it, they would, God's law said, look, if a guy just got married, he does not go to war. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not, the king cannot employ him in any business. You know, and, and, and conscript him and, and to go and do work for him. He had to go about his daily life and cheer up his wife. So, <clears throat> you know, this is something that we need to learn today, too, you know, is that 
It's not all about the battle. And if we make our life all about just fighting day in and day out, just the fight, the battle, the fight, the battle, you know, raging against the Sodomites and this and, you know, and just every false prophet, you know, we have to just call out. And, and, you know, and preachers can fall into this too. They can turn into this just, you know, get in a rut where every sermon is just war, fight, battle, contention, you know. And those things are important. I'm not saying it's not there. We should do that. There's got to be balance in our life. There needs to be balance in our preaching. You know, that we, you know, there's other things to preach about besides the sodomites. There's other things to preach about and remind people of. There's that, that there are certain things in life that God has even given us to enjoy. You know, God's not just up in heaven trying to make life miserable for us. There are things that he wants us to enjoy. And I think these are great examples of it. And we'll get into it. You know, uh, this ties in, I think, greatly with uh, Ecclesiastes. If you would turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. You know, Ecclesiastes is a book that reminds us of this fact repeatedly that there are certain things that God has just given man to enjoy. You're there in chapter 2, look at verse 22. We'll start reading. It says, For what, what hath man of all his labor and all the vexation of his heart wherewith he labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrow and his travail grief. Yea, his heart is not take, taketh not rest at night. This also is vanity. You know, life is hard enough as it is. You know, just living life can be difficult. You know, the labors that we already have to do just to survive in this world. You know, people, let alone having a, you know, a physical or spiritual enemy that you have to do warfare, warfare with. You know, some people, they struggle just to survive. And he's saying here in verse 24, there is nothing better for a man that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. You know, God wants us to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of our labor. You know, and we should not get into this, this hyper-spiritual, this overly spiritual attitude that says, well, you know, I'm just too holy to enjoy anything. You know, and you say, do people do that? Yeah, they're called monks. You know, they go out and live in a, in a monastery with a bunch of dudes and whip themselves, you know, and deny themselves, you know, the pleasures that God is, that are from the hand of God. You know, they command to abstain from meats. You know, they forbid to marry. And these are things that God has given man to enjoy. <coughs> He goes on, it says in verse 25, For who can eat? Who else can hasten unto more than I? For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather, to heap up, that he may give it to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. So again, there's still that balance where you can still go to the other extreme and just say, well, it's just all about enjoying life. And it's about, about not, you know, no battle. You know, and quite frankly, you probably have more people on that going to that extreme than the other. They're saying, well, you know, God, I'm just here to just, we're all under grace and, you know, God is love and God loves everyone and let's not, let's not rock the boat. Let's just get along with everybody and just enjoy life. It's both, folks. It's both. You know, you got to find a balance in life where, you know, we battle when it's appropriate, but sometimes there's a time to draw back, recuperate, you know, and go out another day. Not every battle has to be ours to fight. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes talks about this a great deal. And it says in Ecclesiastes 3, All go into one place, all are of the dust, all turn to dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? You know, we should enjoy our portion. You know, we should enjoy our, we should rejoice in our own works. You know, go out and, and work hard, and enjoy our families, Enjoy our wives, enjoy our spouses, enjoy our children, enjoy the fellowship that we have in the local church. These things are here for us to enjoy. And, and that's, that's something uh, that we've got to keep in mind because the fact is we are battling. You know, we, are we are fighting the warfare. But we don't want to get burned out on that. We don't want to just make it all about that and forget that there's, there's pleasures in this life that God has given to us. <coughs> Look there in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7. He said, Go thy way, eat thy bread, and drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garment be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. You know, these are great verses reminding us that, you know, it's okay to enjoy things. God's giving us permission, you know, go thy way. Eat thy bread with joy. You know, we, you don't have to feel guilty about, you know, going down to Juanito's on a Sunday afternoon, you know, between church and soul winning, you know, and then having, a, having the, 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 the tacos and the, everything else that they have down there to enjoy. You know, eat it up. You know, 
But some people want to be like, I don't know why we aren't just immediately soul winning after the service. <laughs> you know, why can't we just have some protein bars back there <laughs> and we just everyone grabs one on the way out and we just, we, you know, there's souls going to hell and we need to be out there. You know, it's, you know I know we're soul, we're soul winning for three to four hours. We need to be going five to six. You know, last time I checked, evening service is at 5.30. So we could start, you know, at, at 12 and just go right through. We could skip Juanitos. We could skip Smoky Moe's. We could skip Brush Fire. And we would run that guy out of here in a rail, right? <laughs> Say, no, we're going to go. We're, why? Because God, you know, wants us to enjoy the fellowship. And, you know, enjoy the food that he's given. Enjoy the good things in life that he's allowed us to have. You know, go there with, with our hard-earned money that we've labored for throughout the week and spend it so that we can enjoy the f our portion in this life. Drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white, and thy, let thy head lack no ointment. You know, wash your clothes and put on some deodorant. <laughs> I don't know, if that applies, apply it. You know what I mean? Anyway, go down to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. You know, this, this is brought up over and over again. And I think it's a, there's a reason why God, in fact, spent almost an entire book talking about this. is because he knows some people are going to go to an extreme that sometimes we can get so wrapped up in the work and the fight of the, you know, of, 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 of the cause of Christ that we forget that there's other things that God has given us to enjoy in this life. That sometimes you just, you know, as the saying goes, you need to just stop and smell the roses. You know, there's nothing wrong with just stopping for a minute. Even, you know, out, we were out there today soul winning and I stopped for a minute and I just looked at, at uh, this mountain over here with the sunset on it. I said, wow, that's beautiful. You know, and, who, and I gave glory to God. You know, God made that. God did that. You're there in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Let me read to you uh, from Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Let us, hear the whole con let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You know, what is it that God, what's God's will for my life? You know, we, we ask, you know people, when they, especially when they first get saved and when they're young, they really struggle. I know this was a struggle for me. You know, what is it God's exact will for my life? You know, where does God want me to go? Who does he want me to marry? You know, what, you know, it, they want all these details and these specifics to God to just spell it out for them and just say, here, this is how it's going to be for you. You know, they, but that's not how it works with God. Well, you know, what's the conclusion of the whole matter? Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. You know, am I in God's will? I don't know. Are you, are you fearing God and keeping his commandments? Yeah, then you are. That, am, I, you know, am I doing everything I'm supposed to be doing for God? Am I, keeping, am I fulfilling my duty a, a, as a man? Well, are you fearing God and, and keeping his commandments? Yes. Well, congratulations. You know, people get really wrapped up in this. And I know, you know, and I'll just throw it out there. I don't know if anybody is, but, you know, I struggle with this. Like, what, you know, this whole, what is God's will for my life? And I remember a guy, an older Christian, he sat me down one day and he said, you know what? You know, it's kind of like this. When, when uh, Eve was in the garden one day, you know, and, and he told the story to kind of help you understand this. Eve was in the garden one day and she, wanted, she was going to cook Adam dinner. And she said, man, I, you know, I, I want to I make sure I, I cook what God wants me to cook. You know, I don't want to serve a dinner outside of God's will. You know, this is kind of silly. But so she went to the Lord and said, Lord, what would you have me to make for Adam tonight? You know, what, what exactly, you know, do you want me to make for him? And he said to her, of all the trees in the garden, thou mayest freely eat. And yeah, I know, Lord, but what do you want me to make? Of all the trees in the garden, thou mayest freely eat. You know, God gives us options in life. There isn't just this one thing. You know, and of course God gives us, you know, uh, uh, gives us standards and gives us convictions and gives us principles that guide our, our decision making. But, you know, a lot of it God leaves open to us to make our own decisions. You know, Eve, you can pick from that tree or that tree or that tree or that tree. You know, and people, they, they start to wonder, especially young people, you know, who does God want me to marry? Well, let me just narrow it down for you. A saved Christian who loves the Lord. That's your checklist. You know, and, and, and you know, obviously, you know, families and things, they have their own standards that they can, you know, that they, that they can work into that as well. But that's generally it. You know, you don't have to just pray and ask God to read the exact right person, you know. Um, I married the wrong person. And I've heard people say this. They say, I didn't marry in God's will. And that's their excuse for having a terrible marriage. And they say, oh, I married the wrong person. Oh, really? Were they saved? Did they love the Lord? <coughs> Sounds like it was the right person to me. 
So we don't want to get so caught up in that. In this, you know, the, you know, what is exactly that God wants me to do? You know, God's given us liberty in this life to, to make our own decisions and, and, to, and to allow his word to guide us in that decision making. You know, we just trust the Lord with all thine heart and he shall direct thy paths. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, where you are, uh, look at verse 18. Behold, uh, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. You know, that's your portion in life, to, to eat and to drink uh, of that which you, you know, of all your labor under the sun. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. You know, our, our ability to go out and work and earn a living and to enjoy the fruits of our labor, that is the gift of God. That is something that God has given us to enjoy. And I think that's something that we have to keep in mind as we live this Christian life. And it's such, you know, especially as people who, who want to take a stand for God. You know, we want to go out. We want to do the work of the Lord. We want to go out and save souls. We want to, you know, we want to, we want to preach the hard sermons. We want to, you know, hear the hard sermons. We want to stand behind a man of God. We want to, you know, take a stand for Christ and our families and our, you know, in all of our relationships. You know, we want to, we want to fight the fight. We do want to do that. We understand that. But let's not get just so overboard on that that we forget all the good things in life that God has given us to enjoy. Otherwise, life will just turn into this just dreary, you know, just grind through life of living for Christ. That's not what God wants. <coughs> You know, see, if we make our life all about the battle, about this battle, you know, we're going to miss out on a lot of what God intended us to enjoy. You know, I think that's something that we as men, you know, those that that support, uh, you know, are 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 the sole providers for a family. You know, that's a real important job that we have. You know, we have to we have to work hard and make sure the bills are paid and everything. You know, every take care of a family. That's a big responsibility. And it's important. But let's not get so busy. And I understand there's seasons where we have to do things and that, you know, dad's just got to go and, and he doesn't get to see the kids as much as he wants or the wife as much as he wants. You know, maybe it's, it's just a few hours a day, if, you, if that. You know, but, and that's the way life is sometimes. But we should make it a point not to just let our life become all about work where we forget the people that we're even providing for. You know, we, we forget to just stop and enjoy what it is that we're working for. We forget to enjoy the house that we're laboring to dwell in. We forget to enjoy the food that we're working to provide. We forget to enjoy the children that we're working to care for. You know, we don't want to make our life all about that. We also need to make sure we get that balance and not to miss out on what God has given us to enjoy. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7, I'll just read to you, Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise, why shouldest thou destroy thyself? You know, if we try to be overly righteous, you know, you know, righteous over much, we're just gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna involve ourselves in every ministry. We're gonna go to every single missions trip. I mean, I was at that conference, man. I wanted to go to every single missions trip, and then I realized I can't. <laughs> you know, there's, a, I, I will destroy myself. You know, I want to hike down with Pastor Anderson into the Grand Canyon and reach that tribe that lives down there but I can't. <laughs> I'll destroy myself. <laughs> you know, that's my own fault. But we can't, I can't involve myself in every ministry. I have plenty of stuff to do. You know, and it's like that for all of us. We have plenty of life to keep us busy, plenty of duties and demands, just, just, just living life. You know, we don't need to take on more than we can bear. You know, I'm not saying we shouldn't ever push ourselves or try to do more or reach another level, but there also reaches a point where you can't bear that load and it will over time just just crush you so we don't want to be over much righteous over much you know there's nothing wrong with letting other people fight certain battles you know that's a great thing about you know that's why it's so important that we all are part of the local church and that we participate because you know what there might be a battle that i can't fight today that you can you know maybe i maybe i just got done fighting some battle i just got you know wore myself out and I'm at the point where I just can't do anymore. And then this other brother comes in, you know, he's like the tag, you know, like the wrestling tag team guy, you know, like, you know and he jumps in the ring. Now it's his turn and I could step back and freshen up. It's like when they change, change lines in hockey, right? Those guys are out there, they're, they're trying to score the goal, they're working hard, but their legs start to burn out and they have to run over and somebody else comes in with a fresh set of legs. 
It's like that in the, in the Christian life too. And that's what's so great about the local church is that when there's more of us, we can do more work and it's not just a smaller group of people trying to do all the work, if that makes sense. You know, we can, we can let other people fight certain battles and save our strength for another day. Let's go ahead and turn back to Ecclesiastes, or not Ecclesiastes, but Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. So he's saying there, you know, look, you're going to go out to battle and if there's anybody that has, you know, built a house or, or planted a vineyard or have got, ha, and has taken a wife and hasn't enjoyed those things, you need to go back and enjoy them. And it's not because they're going to be a distraction to you in the battlefield. You know, it's not because you're going to be thinking, it's because God wants you to go enjoy those things. Lest another man come and enjoy those things on your behalf because you're, you're dead. <clears throat> and he goes on in verse 8 and says, And the officers, officer shall speak further unto the people and shall say, what man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brother, brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. So this is another great... So God's just trying to kind of... He's whittling down the forces, right? There's only certain people that he wants to go into the battle to fight his, his, his fight. And the first people are that he gets rid of, he says, look, if you haven't enjoyed these things, you need to go. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what God wants for those people. And then there's these people, which are the fearful, people that are afraid to go to the battle. The people that are saying, I know God said he's with us, but I'm, I'm still not so sure about that. And he says, look, you need to leave. And why is that? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brother's heart faint as well as his heart. The reason why God wants fearful people out of the ranks is because fear is contagious. You know, one guy could be like, man, I'm ready to go out and fight this battle. God's on our side. I know there's more of them than there are of us, but I'm excited to see God fight on our behalf and do a great work. And they can get real excited, and then another guy comes along like, man, do you really think we're going to be able to pull this off? I don't know. And then this guy starts doubting himself. Oh, well, maybe that guy's onto something. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I am a little overconfident. You know, fear is contagious. It catches on. And, and that's something that we have to keep in mind. That, that, that's one of the dangers of being fear, a fearful person is it rubs off on other people. And of course, this is talking, you know, explicitly in the context of going to an actual physical battle. You know, that this is a very practical thing. You know, if we're going to go fight an actual warfare, a physical warfare, you know, fear will cloud your thinking. It will, it, you'll, you'll, you'll panic. You won't make the right decisions. You'll get distracted. You'll be so worried about saving your own skin that you won't, you know, employ the proper tactics or whatever to, in order to win the battle. You'll just be afraid. And that spreads to everybody, and that's how armies get, that's how they end up just getting turned to flight and just taking off. <coughs> so God's saying, look, no fearful people. It's too contagious. They're not allowed to fight. And then it, he says there in uh, verse 9, we'll move along here, it says, and it shall be when the officers have made an end of speaking that, uh, unto the people that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. So notice when they made the captains. It wasn't before the speaking, it was after the speech. After the priest came and said, if anybody has, it, has anything to go home and enjoy, go and do that. If anyone's afraid, leave. Then he says, and then they shall make themselves uh, our, our captains to lead the army, uh, to, to lead uh, the people. And what we see from this is that, you know, God only wants leaders who are going to be focused on the task at hand. That's who he wants the captains to be. He doesn't want people that have any fear in them, you know, people that, you know, are probably more seasoned in life, people that have already had the vineyard, they've already had the wife, they've already had, you know, the house, they've already enjoyed these things, you know, they've, they've, they've had their portion in this life, you know, they've got some experience. That's who God wants to be the leaders. That's who he wants to rise up and make uh, the captains. Well, what's really I want also to see here is that, you know, you really don't know who leaders are until you get in a battle. I mean, if there's no battle, there's really no need for captains, right? What's well, a point of a point of, of, of you know of, of choosing out captains if there's no battle to fight? You're like, hey, you're going to be a captain of the army. Great. When do we go to fight? Never. Oh, well, I feel real important now because I'm fulfilling a role that's completely unnecessary. But what we see is that when there is a battle, that's when captains matter. That's when the leaders matter, and it's conflict that creates leaders. Conflict is what creates leaders. That's what brings them to the forefront. And, you know, that, that's, that's the reality, is that battle, you know, 
is, is the opportunity, uh, you know, the, the reality of battle, okay, when people are facing battle, a re that reality, and then they are given the opportunity to leave, you know, certain people are saying, hey, if, if you're afraid, you can go. No hard feelings. You need to leave. We want you to go. And people start to back out. That's when the cream rises to the top, if that makes sense. That's when the best of the people, the, 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 the true leaders, the captains, come to the forefront. Say, I'm not afraid. You know, I've, I've enjoyed these things. I don't have any reason to go anywhere else. I'm I want to be here. You know, conflict is what creates leaders. And we have, people always have such a negative connotation of, of battle. Because there is a lot of negativity that goes along with it. It's not enjoyable. Warfare was not something that is pleasurable, you know. But there is... There is a, a benefit in the fact that it creates leaders. It brings leaders to the forefront. You know, and we should, never sh we should never shy away from that. You know, we should never just try to make our life about never getting a ba in a battle. Or make our life about, let's attend a church that is never going to get in hot water with the media. <laughs> you know, let's attend a church where the preacher is never going to say anything controversial because heaven forbid we should ever get in any kind of a conflict. You know, and we're talking here about actual, literal, physical warfare. You know, but in, 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 in comparison, having a, a picketers outside, you know, and by, in, by means of comparison, having the news media come interview the church or film the church, that's, that's nothing. It's not going to cost you your life. You know, the, 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 the 11 o'clock news lady isn't showing up with a broadsword and a shield looking to take your head off. You know, they're just trying to fill a 15-minute piece or whatever, five-minute gap in their news, in their, you know, their, their rounds or whatever they call it. That's all they're trying to do. But that right there is enough for some people to say, whoa, I just can't, you know, this isn't for me. Well, then you know what? You're not a leader. You know, oh, I'm, I, I'm gonna, I might get sued by some sodomite. Well, you know, I'm, I'm too afraid to, to, to take a stand. You know what? Then you're not meant to be a captain. Go back, you know, and, and don't expect to lead if that's you. So there's nothing negative, you know, there, there, there's good things to be found in conflict. And one of them is, is the fact that it creates opportunity for leaders to come to the forefront. <coughs> now he goes on here in verse, set, uh, verse 10 and he says, When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be, if it, may, if it answer thee, uh, if it make the an thee, the an excuse me, if it make the answer of peace and, and open unto thee, then it should be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. Now you have to, you're saying, wait a minute, I thought I told him to destroy everybody. You got to keep reading, okay? He's talking about a very specific people here. He goes on in verse 12, And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself, and thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The, verse 15 clarifies who we're talking about. Thus shall ye do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations. Remember again, God told him to destroy the cities of these nations. Every man, woman, child, everything that breathed, they were to destroy of these nations. But th these people that are very far off, he's saying, look, there's going to be an opportunity to them for, to have peace. You know, if you come and besiege their city and they answer peace and open to you, and surrender, everyone lives. If they resist you, all the men die. Everybody else lives. So, you know, God isn't just out to wipe every single person off the face of the earth. The reason why we've talked about it extensively on these Thursday nights, if you haven't heard it already, the reason why he's wiping out the Canaanites is because they were all given to the most abominable filth that the, um, mankind can involve himself in. Right? And that's something that's been preached multiple times we've mentioned already. I'm sure everybody understands. So God is showing mercy to these people who live uh, far not these people far away. Now why? Why is it that these people live that far away they get the mercy? Because these people have not come under the influence of the Canaanites. They're far enough away to where they haven't been affected by the Canaanites, by their culture, by their wicked society. And really what we have to keep in mind, the way we can apply that today is that we don't want to just lump every unbeliever in with reprobates. You know, we don't want to, when we go out soul winning and knocking on doors, we run into somebody, you know, they don't answer peace unto us, they don't open unto us. We don't want to just say reprobate, you know, these people just deserve to be destroyed. You know, obviously, you know, they wouldn't even say hi to me. They just shook their head, say not interested, clearly a reprobate. 
Clearly somebody who hates God. No, maybe somebody who just, you know, had a hard day. Maybe somebody who on the way to the door was in a great mood, but then stubbed their toe in the coffee table. Or the dog's barking. Or they have bills to pay. Or, you know, they got a bad phone, they got a bad news on a phone call that day. Who knows? <clears throat> so we don't want to just lump everybody together when they reject us at the door and say, well, you know, that's them. You know, they're, they're probably, you know, well, have, have fun in hell, buddy. You know? <laughs> you had your chance. Don't say God didn't give you a chance. You know, I was here. You know, that's not the attitude we want to have. And I don't know that any of us in this room have that attitude. You know, I'd be shocked if anybody did. I've, I've never seen it. But it is out there. And there is that tendency to do that. To say, hey, you know what? This guy rejected me. He must be just, he just must be a reprobate. I've seen people just write people off as reprobates over the dumbest things. You know, and even, even in their own families. This is more common in, in families. When people say, I think my parents are reprobate. <laughs> why because they won't hear they won't let me preach the gospel to them you know there's other factors that go into that uh, into why they won't don't want to hear it from you you know i hear that a lot you know parents don't want to hear it from their kids in fact i experienced that for years too because here's the thing parents you know it, it's kind of an embarrassing thing when your your child has to come to you and answer life's most you know pressing question what happens to you when you die hey mom dad i figured it out <laughs> Let me clue you in for once. You know, it's not supposed to work that way. And they know it. So maybe that's why they don't want to hear it from you. It's not because there's some God-hating reprobate that deserves to, you know, have the ground split open underneath their feet and fall straight alive in the pit. <laughs> you know? But people have that attitude. That they all must be Canaanites. You know? Even these people far off over here, these guys clearly, you know, just must be these Canaanites. Let's slaughter them. You know? Let's just write them off. No, you know, we need to be, have discernment and say these people aren't like these people. They're different. You know, you know, give them a chance. Give them peace, you know. And even if they reject you, you know, spare the women and children. You know, they might reject you the first time at the door or at the, you know, over the, over the, at the coffee table with your family, whoever, wherever is the circumstance. Give them mercy, you know. Come back again later. Let, let time work, you know. Give it time. Be a light. Be a witness. Be faithful. And maybe God will make opportunity. Or maybe somebody else will come along that they'll hear from. So we don't want to just lump all every believer together with, with reprobates. <clears throat> the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men. Right? Why? That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. When we're trying to free somebody you know, get them to salvation. There's a, there's a conflict there. You know, the devil wants to keep them. And I'll tell you what, the devil sees you coming. You know, if you're, if you're saved and you're on fire for the Lord and you're preaching the gospel and you're praying for your family, don't you think the devil knows that? The devil might be keeping tabs on who it is you're going to try and talk to. I mean, he might not know who you're going to go talk to today out there soul winning at 5.30. He might not know where we're going to go and start working and, and trying to do that. But he knows who your family is. And it might be that he just spends a little more extra time on them, saying, giving them reasons not to listen to you. They're taken captive by him at his will. So that's why you should be gentle. That's why you shouldn't strive. And just give them another opportunity. And just at the first time that they say, no, I'm not interested, that, you know, that's not, just, that's not your opportunity to write them off and say, you know, to hell with you. It's the wrong attitude to have. I got to uh, wrap it up here, so we're gonna just going to jump ahead to. Uh, we'll just get back into it here in uh, in verse uh, sixteen. He says in verse sixteen, but the, of the cities of these people, okay, now these are the reprobates, right? Which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, nothing. I mean, everything's going. The cat, the dog, the whole family, and go in there, take the fishbowl, dump it out, <laughs> let it flop. You know, <laughs> everything's got to die. Thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites. He's being real specific here. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God commandeth thee. So he's saying, look, yeah, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be scorched earth for these people, but it's for these people. And that's not just to me that they're general. This wasn't their, you know, their foreign policy for everybody. 
This was just to these specific people for reasons that we've already gone over, <coughs> which is reiterated here in verse 18, that they teach you not to do after all their abominations. So God knows that if they just let them dwell in the land, that sure enough, they would start to teach them all the wicked things that they did. And this is a principle that we need to understand as Christians, is that the bad make the good bad every time. It does not work the other way around, you know. And it's like that, the proverbial, uh, you know, young lady who says, who's going to marry the wrong guy. I'm going to change him. No, you're not. <laughs> I know he's not saved. I know he's got all these bad habits. But I'm going to change him. You know, he's going to be my project. That's not going to work. It's going to make him, he's going to make you bad. That you see that all the time in scripture. And you can apply that to every, in, you know, any, any instance. And, and a lot of Baptist churches, you know, I've seen people, they, they get this. You know, I remember one uh, Baptist college I visited, they had, they had this huge bus route ministry. Huge bus, I mean, hundreds of these kids they were bringing in. And they were a big church themselves, so they had a lot of, you know, homeschooled, you know, church kids that were there, you know, like in their, in their, in their uh, schools and in their Sunday school. And they had a Sunday school. They had one Sunday school for all the church kids, and then they had a Sunday school for all the, 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 the brats from Gary, you know, the ghetto. And I remember thinking, why do you guys do that? I thought, oh, what are you, racist? <laughs> you know? what's, what's going on here? And they said, no, it's because the bad make the, good bad, uh, make the good bad. It's never the other way around. And I said, yeah, I guess that's right. You know, so people, you know, that's something we need to understand in life, that we're not going to, you know, we shouldn't pal around and hope to change people who have bad habits. You know, of course, you know, we're going we're gonna to have to associate, you know, and rub shoulders with people every now and then. But we should never make it our life's ambition to, you know, reform other people. Because they'll end up teaching you their bad ways. And you'll start to go, well, you know, maybe that habit isn't so bad after all. Maybe that way of thinking, maybe I'm the one that's wrong. You'll start to question your own self. And you might even end up joining them. <laughs> and he says uh, that, that, that they teach you not to do after all their abominations, which they have done unto their gods. So should ye sin against the Lord your God, when thou shalt besiege a city a long time, and making war against it to take it, Thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them, for thou mayest eat of them. And thou shalt not cut them down, for the tree of the field is man's life to employ them in the siege. Only the trees which thou knowest that they be not trees for meat, thou shalt destroy and cut them down. And thou shalt build bulwarks against the city and make the war, uh, make, maketh war uh, with thee until it be uh, subdued. So what he's saying is here, look, when you come up against the city, and it's defensed, and you realize this is going to take a long time, because back then a practice was is that they would starve the people out. You know, and we read about that. That even happened in Jerusalem when you know, the Babylonians, the Assyrians came to it. They besieged it, and they, and they, you know, they starved them out, essentially, because <coughs> nobody could leave to go out into the fields and work. So what he's saying is, like, you know, if you come up against this, you know, go ahead and cut down the trees that are not fruit-bearing. Right? You know, don't cut down the apple tree, don't count, cut down the peach trees and the almond trees and the olive trees, whatever trees they have over there. You know, if they're fruit bearing trees, you need to keep those. You know, and this seems like it's real, this, you're like, duh, you know, this just seems kind of like a, well, of course, you know, who's going to cut these down? And the reason why he's telling them is like, he's saying, look, you can, I want you to eat of those trees. Well, yeah, of course, why wouldn't they? Well, if you remember in Leviticus 19, you know, I'll read to you for sake of time. It says, When you shall come into land and shall have planted all manner of trees for that food, then you shall uh, count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised three years, as it shall be uncircumcised unto you. It shall not be eaten of. Right? Saying, Look, when you come to the land, you're not going to eat of the trees for the first three years. You're not going to just start eating the fruit of the land right away. He said, You had to wait three years. The fourth year it was to be the Lord's, and then the fifth year they began to eat of it. So that's why God's clarifying this here. He's saying, look, when, you, when you're besieging the city, go ahead and eat of it. Why? Because you're so busy you know, doing warfare, you can't think about where else you're going to get food. So he's saying, you know, go ahead and eat of those trees. You know, don't cut them down. You, they're useful to sustain you while you're in warfare. But once they possess the land, now it's time to Leviticus 19. Where the, the you know, three years it's going to rest, the fourth year is the Lord's, the fifth year we eat of it. So there's probably a whole other application of that. Uh, that might come in another sermon. <clears throat> and he's saying, look, you know, don't, don't eat these trees. So, 
you know, we try to make application as we go through these chapters, but you know, there, besides the applications that we make tonight, there's just some real practical matters of how to conduct an actual physical war. I mean, that's really what Deuteronomy chapter 20 is. It's about how to go in, they were to go in and defeat these enemies. And what were some of the things they saw? You know, the fearful were not welcome. They were told to leave because their fear is contagious. That certain of the enemy were to be given opportunity to be spared. You know, that not everybody was a Canaanite worthy of death. That there were certain enemies that were to be given an opportunity for peace, right? And w what we can really apply tonight, though, what we try to drive home is that there's more to life than just fighting battles. You know, this was a big part of the children of Israel's history, but it came to an end. God had, it, God had an end for it. There was going to come a time when the last Canaanite was killed, and then it was going to be a time of peace, and they were going to flourish and enjoy, you know, this portion of this life. And the Bible says there's a time to kill and there's a time to heal. There's a time to break down. There's a time to build up. There's a time to love. There's a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. So we shouldn't make our life all about the battle. We should battle when we need to fight. You know, when it's time to fight, it's time to fight. And let's not be afraid, you know, but let's also remember that that's not what our life is all about. That there's other things that God has given us to enjoy in this life. And that one day, even if we're getting weary in the battle, that God intends that battle to come to an end. There will be a season of peace in our lives. God gives you know, rest and respite unto those that he loves. He cares for his children. He's not just going to you know, drive us into the ground and destroy us. But we have to kind of use our heads about you know, when is it a time to fight and when is it a time of peace. Let's go ahead and pray.